From 1841 to 1997, the United Kingdom ruled Hong Kong. It began with the occupation and eventual cessation of Hong Kong Island during the First Opium War. Then the colony expanded to its current size with the 99-year lease of the new territories after the Second Opium War. But in October 1949, the communists won the Chinese Civil War. They sought the reunification of Hong Kong with the motherland. Yet at the same time, throughout the volatile 1950s and into the 1970s, the communists would restrain their massive armies and respect the boundary between itself and Hong Kong, a boundary with literally no geographical protection. Why did the communists leave Hong Kong alone for so long? The, success, the seeding of Hong Kong Island and its territories happened under the rule of the Qing Dynasty. The Qing had been a failed government for decades. It had attempted to reform but could not do so effectively, and in 1911, it fell. Thus, the winds of change began to blow. New ownership had taken root, and they were not happy about these Hong Kong treaties. One might assume that Mao Zedong and the communists were unique in their stance towards the unequal treaty ceding Hong Kong, Kowloon, and the new territories. But before being evicted from the mainland, Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China had already been making moves towards taking Hong Kong back from the British. Chiang had offered the British the Republic of China's aid in defending Hong Kong during World War II, which they declined. When Hong Kong and Singapore and Burma fell to the Japanese, irritation on the Chinese side only gained. Even before World War II had ended, the Republic of China had started agitating for the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty. The United Kingdom, for their part, were not ready to do that. Hong Kong had been nothing but a barren rock before the British came along. And at the time, they still oversaw a massive colonial empire that included areas like India, Malaya, and Burma. London at the time resisted giving up sovereignty over those areas. It could have been a huge political imbroglio because if there's one thing Chiang and Mao agreed upon, it is that China can never be divided. Winning World War II as one of the five great post-war powers had left the Chinese with great national pride. They wanted to erase the shame from the relic Qing Dynasty era. For all the threats and bluster, though, Chiang had bigger fish to fry. He had to first win the Chinese Civil War against the Communists, which he did not. Thus, October 1st, 1949, the Communist People's Republic of China came into being. Mao's decision to ally the country with the Soviet-aligned Revolutionary Communist bloc put it at opposing ends with the United Kingdom. Hong Kong thus found itself on the brink. In 1899, when the British were negotiating the lease of the new territories, the original line had been the shenzhen Shamton River, which nobody really liked. The British recognized what was obvious to everyone. There is literally nothing between China and Hong Kong. No hill, no mountain range, nothing. They haggled over where to put the border. The British suggested the hills north of Shenzhen, and the Chinese suggested a hill far south of Shenzhen. It so went back and forth, until finally it sat where it was at the start. Taiwan Island has the turning Taiwan Strait in between it and the mainland. Hong Kong has a small 11-foot bamboo fence. Both London and the Hong Kong government knew that if the Ch Communist government decided to invade, then there would be little options to prevent a takeover. Except for a very brief period in 1949, when the British had massively reinforced the garrison at the border, there would be no period of time in which Hong Kong could conceivably defend an outright Communist military invasion. There simply was not enough manpower, and the United States would have to intervene, and Eisenhower would not give a solid security guarantee that he would actually do so. Probably rightfully so, as defending Hong Kong from the PRC would have required an immense number of troops, and bringing in that many onto Chinese soil could trigger a massive conflagration. Nevertheless, it is generally accepted that had the Chinese done so, then the Americans would have probably intervened anyway. A critical reason why the massive army at the Hong Kong borders in, 19, in October 1950 did not actually do so. Hong Kong represented a whole lot to the United Kingdom. The colony's economy was rapidly expanding. Tens of millions of pounds had been invested in Hong Kong. It and its port served as the touchstone for the burgeoning East Asia trade economy, and having it meant that the United Kingdom would be a large player in that sphere of the world. Losing Hong Kong could potentially be devastating. Tensions furthered in 1950 with the outbreak of the Korean War. The Chinese joined in on the side of the North Koreans, putting it at ends with the British, then fighting for the South Koreans. The United Nations passed in a resolution condemning China as an aggressor in Korea, something that would never happen today. Yet even the Chinese did not decide to take Hong Kong. Nevertheless, the British decided to place its own colony on an economic blacklist, causing its economy great grief. The reason the United Kingdom did so has a lot to do with why Hong Kong had been left alone by the Communists. The Chinese Communist Party came to power by violently displacing the former nationalist government. They lacked national, international recognition and ties with the West. Mao Zedong had only left the country once in his entire life. 
Over the span of 100 plus years, Hong Kong had always been the gateway through which trade and ties flowed between China and the rest of the world. It remaining as a Western colony will always irk the Chinese as a reminder of the shame of its unequal treaty years, but China needed Hong Kong then to function still as a gateway. China provides Hong Kong with its raw goods and return gets an outlet for its few exports. Some $431 million in goods traded between China and Hong Kong in 1951, growing at 45% a year. This unspoken agreement, though, has a caveat. China leaves Hong Kong alone for the duration of its lease, for as long as Hong Kong did not foment trouble. This meant taking care of the people living within the Hong Kong borders and not destabilizing the situation. This got much harder in the 1960s with the economic disasters of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. These two events caused massive waves of immigration from the provinces of Guangdong into Hong Kong as people looked for work. 1962 in particular would see events that sparked tension and additional militarization of the border. Prior to the late 1950s, the border had generally been open. People could go in and out as they wished. But as the Korean War dragged on and the economic disasters on the mainland continued, the number of refugees began to rise. The British and the Chinese began closing down the crossings so to prevent a situation in which Hong Kong would be overwhelmed by illegal immigrants. This helped a little, but the Chinese still no occasionally attested the boundaries. The most notable event happened in 1962. In 1962, the British had just passed the Commonwealth Immigrants Act, which further cut down free entry of colonial and post-colonial workers into Britain. Then suddenly in April 1962, Chinese guards mysteriously stopped watching their side of the border, allowing tens of thousands of refugees to cross the Shenzhen River into Hong Kong. This went on for weeks. On a single day in May, over 5,500 immigrants were detained by the police. Thousands more fled and hid in the shantylands within the new territories. It was a PR disaster. The hysteria was a replay of the stuff you saw with the crises in Syria or the refugee convoys coming out of Central America. The press took photos of Hong Kong police and British soldiers carting young Chinese people, kids, mothers, teens, to the border and shoving them back on the other side of the river. Chinese police officers would quit their jobs because they were unwilling to use force and violence on their own race. And then you got the newspaper shouting to the world about this crisis and how London had lost control of the whole situation. It was all great stuff. And then suddenly on May 23rd, the Chinese Communist Party announced that they would seal off their side of the border, and the soldiers began watching again. Beijing told London that they will try to hold back the immigrant wave, and the border area was normal by May 29th. No one really knows what the Chinese government had been thinking throughout the whole situation, Today, historians believe the famine had been destabilizing, had destabilized the Guangdong government so much that it temporarily lost control of the area rather than a deliberate evil communist plot to topple Hong Kong. Times have changed since then, obviously. Today, Shenzhen is in the slum in Guangdong. It is now a thriving city of its own. Uh, here's some pictures of Shenzhen from the 1980s. You can see how it was back then. Uh, and here is, is now. Same, same street, here it is now. Same street, here it is now. Pretty cool. But the Imbroglio did emphasize to everyone who held, who held the sword over Hong Kong's head. Hong Kong depends on the mainland for its food, its water, its security, and its economy. China could use any of that to bring Hong Kong to a heel in a second. But it would not even need to do that. All they needed to do was to stop holding back the masses on their side of the border, and thus China realized that they had all the levers that they ever needed. Hong Kong existed as it was because China allowed it to be. Unlike Singapore, India, and Burma, and other British colonies, it could not be granted independence. Its decolonization would be assimilation. 